Jesus and everything. And so as we dive into the scriptures this morning, this is something that uh, a lot of believers during the times that we're living in, they've forgotten this basic principle of just seeking the Holy Spirit and asking him, what is it you want me to do? And so I'm going to show you some dynamics. I'm going to take one verse and I'm going to just really dissect it, uh, it to the nuts and bolts and make it really raw and easy to understand. So you can have some practical application on how to actually apply the scripture. Um, my disclaimer is I use multiple translations as always. Well, of course, we use the authorized King James as our foundational text, but there's some folks who, who have a difficult time with other translations. That's a great opportunity for you to walk in love. So the title to our session is called Supernatural Guidance. How many of you could use some supernatural guidance? I don't know about you, but, you know, especially in the times that we're living on, I really need to make sure that my GPS is, is pointed in the right direction, that it's lined up with God's plan. Amen? In the book of John, chapter 5, verse 19, the message translation says, Jesus explained himself at length. Can you imagine sitting in on that Bible study? Jesus explaining himself at length, starting from Genesis all the way through. And he says this, I'm telling you this straight, okay? Uh, I'm telling you this straight, okay? The son can, uh, <laughs> the son can't independently do a thing, only that he sees the father doing. What the father does, the son does. Now that's a strong that's a strong statement for Jesus to say. And what he's shown us is he's showing us a pattern of lifestyle that you and I can uh, adapt to. Don't do anything unless you see the Father guiding you to do this. All right? So Jesus is talking about, I seem to have lost the mic or something up here. I don't know why. Check one, two. All right. Jesus is, 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 is saying that he doesn't do anything unless he sees the Father doing it. Did everybody see that? All right. Let's look at verse 20. The Father loves the Son and, uh, and includes Him in everything He is doing. But you haven't seen anything yet. So what Jesus is saying that what He sees the Father had planned in heaven, He's walking it out here on earth. How many of you know that God has our lives already planned out here on earth? Our days are numbered. Our life is planned out. You and I can walk in, in the fullness of God. We can walk in the presence of God. And, and so if our lives are planned out, all we have to do is we just have to bring ourselves into an alignment. Lord, how is it you want me to handle this situation? Where is it you want me to go? What is it you want me to do? How should I handle this person, etc. and so forth? So I want you to see that Jesus didn't do anything unless he saw the Father do it. So what does that mean? Instead of making an impulsive decision, he had to pause and check within himself to see what God wanted to do. The book of John, chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Let's go ahead and begin to dissect some of this stuff. Is it okay if I teach you this morning? And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was not. Now... Jesus had just got through conducting a healing crusade. Multitudes had been healed and so forth. He and the boys went up to a mountain. They're taking a break. And I want you to notice even something historical that caught my attention was this. The Passover, which was the feast of the Jews, was at hand. The Passover originally was the feast of God. It was known in the Old Testament as the feast of the Lord. But the Jews had corrupted it because they embellished it so much with their own traditions and so forth. So God turned it over. And so when you read in the New Testament about the Feast of the Jews, it originally started out as the Feast of the Lord. But that's one of the reasons Jesus said, because of your traditions, you have made the word of God of none effect. It's no different than going into some denominational churches. And because of their traditions, we don't see the power of God moving. I don't know about you. I need the power of God to move in my life. I need it every day. I want to pray the prayer of Moses every time I leave the house. Lord, I don't want to go outside these doors unless your presence is with me. So he's holy conducting a healing crusade. And they're taking a break. And uh, 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 all of a sudden he begins to, uh, he begins to talk to his disciples. Some of the things that have been going on. And then I want you to notice in verse 5 and 6. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes. Everybody say lifted up his eyes. 
And he saw a great company coming to him. Okay. He saith unto Philip, whence shall we buy bread? Where should we buy bread? Okay. So that we can feed these guys. That they may eat. And this he said to prove him. For he himself knew what he would do. Did everybody catch that? All right. We're going to dissect some of this stuff. And I want to mess with your religion. Is that okay? Turn someone and say, he does that all the time. Don't worry, you'll come out all right. <laughs> During the break time, okay, they're interrupted by a crowd of people seeking more of his ministry. We don't know if they're seeking be uh, ministry because of the healing crusade or because he fed the multitude before. But they're hungry for the supernatural. And so they went up into a mountain to take a break. Obviously, some folks were watching them go to take a break, him and the boys. And so they just decided to get together. And now they're going to go ahead and, and, and bombard him. Breaks over. Now, I want you to notice something. He said he turned to Philip during this time. Okay. And he suggests that they feed this crowd. You have, you have Jesus. You have 12 disciples. You have a multitude. Anytime there's a multitude scripturally, there's a minimum of 500 up to 1,000 or more people that have gathered around him. Now, I don't know about you, if you study the life of Philip, Philip was very analytical. Jesus is asking him a question, how are we going to feed these guys? And if you read this, uh, the passages, you'll find out, well, even if we had enough money to buy bread, there'd be no place to go to buy all the bread that we need to feed them. So he knew that Philip was going to be analytical about it. But I want you to see that Jesus is initiating a test by saying test. Now... God does not tempt, but he will test. Are you still with me? All right. So sometimes when you're going through things and you're trying to rebuke the devil and nothing's being rebuked, maybe it's a God test. Maybe heaven has recognized you for promotion and God is trying to promote you, what we say in the Christian church, to the next level. All right. Now I want you to know something. It says here that Jesus knew what he was going to do. Is that what it says? Let's say it together. Jesus knew what he was going to do. Now, let me mess with your religious box. When it says that Jesus knew what he was going to do, is it saying that Jesus knew what Jesus was going to do because he knew what the Father wanted him to do? Or is it saying that Jesus knew what Philip was going to do? What if the both, what if both is the correct answer? It says that Jesus knew what he was going to do. Who's the personal pronoun to? Is it talking about, does Jesus know, knew what he was going to do? More than likely so. But did he not also know what Philip was going to do? Did he know that Philip was going to get analytical? And so I want to go ahead and I want to mess with your religion just a little bit. Turn someone and say, you just did. Okay. Jesus knew that Philip was going to get analytical. He knew that he was going to start talking about money and there's not enough at Walmart. Even if we cleared out the whole shelves, we didn't have enough. Besides, we don't have enough masks to stand in line to get into the Jerusalem bakery in order to buy this stuff. He knew he was going to get analytical about it. Does everybody see that? And he knew, okay, uh, that he was going to end up feeding the multitudes. He knew that they were coming here, but he also initiated a God test to see what would transpire. Now, I want you to notice something. How did Jesus know what he was going to do? How did Jesus know what Philip was going to do? And how did Jesus know what God, his father, wanted him to do? Because we just read the verse that he doesn't do anything unless he sees his father doing it. So obviously, he saw his father wanting him to feed the multitudes. So how do we know that Jesus knew what to do? The answer is in verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes. When we read that in our westernized mind, we get the impression Jesus is looking down. He's talking to the boys. He begins to hear a crowd and he looks up and he sees a multitude. That's how you and I would interpret it. Is that not true? Is it possible that not only did Jesus look up and saw the multitude coming from a distance, but after he saw the problem arising, he also looked up to see, Father, how do you want me to handle this? Oh, you want me to feed them? Okay, let's work this thing out. 
And so we just assume when we read it in our vernacular that, you know, Jesus just looked up and saw the multitudes. But what we don't realize is that there's a possibility that Jesus looked up because it says he doesn't do anything unless he sees his father doing it. How would he know what his father wanted him to do if he didn't look up to see what the father was doing? And that's one thing we don't do anymore. When a crisis comes, when a situation arises, we do everything but look up. Father, how do you want me to handle this? How do you want me to handle this husband of mine? How do you want me to handle these prodigal kids of mine? How do you want me to handle this financial situation? What is it you want me to do? And that's a lost art. And Jesus is giving us an example here. Not only did he look up to see the multitude, but there's a great possibility, and I'll see if I can validate this through other scriptures, that also that he looked up to see what the Father wanted him. How many times have you and I gone through a situation without looking up? We start, uh, we stare at the problem. We try to figure out the details. We try to handle things logically, and we forget that we have a supernatural GPS system within us. God's protective spirit, GPS. We have God's protective spirit to guide us and direct us in the way that we should go. Now, how many times do we just, you know, try to focus on all the details of our problems? How are we going to come up with the money? What about this? What did the doctors say? What are we going to do about this financial mountain? How are we going to handle this? Where are we going to... Am I talking to anybody? What am I going to do with my prodigals? What about my husband? What about my wife? What about this marriage? What about this relationship? What about these health issues? What are we going to do? And we focus on the details and we focus on the problems. And did we ever stop to think that maybe if Jesus is our example, that all we have to do is look up? Am I talking to anybody? Yes. Now, Jesus... <laughs> Usually what we do is we draw conclusions over a situation before we look up. Well, we can't afford this. We might as well just go ahead and quit. We do these things without ever bothering to see what God would have us do. There's many times that when I've come into a situation, I remember one time going into a, 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 a government building, having to take care of some paperwork, and, and I don't know if you know this, but sometimes people are real snobs. Can I say snob? Amen. They're just a real snob. They, they, are, they have professional attitudes. They got a BA, a behavioral attitude. Okay? And, and so uh, one of my sons was with me, and, and they, I mean, just a bad attitude. Now, I don't know about you. There's some days when I walk around, I don't want to be Mr. Christian. Am I talking to anybody? I just want to, you know, lay the smack down and get it done, and I don't want to put up with your lip. But so I just prayed underneath my breath. Father, I thank you just for changing them. You said that you can change the heart of a person like you can bend a river. They walked away, came back, and had a big smile on their face. Well, I'm so glad to help you. Amen. And I was about ready to cop an attitude. But I thought, you know what? Let's give God's word a try first. And things worked out for my benefit. Now, what would have happened if I would have just taken it in my hand and matched an attitude with an attitude? I mean, <laughs> look at some of you. Uh, I need to tie my shoe now, brother Pastor John. I don't know. How many times have we done the same thing? Somebody comes at us with an attitude, and so we go, well, I cannot do your attitude. <laughs> you know, you think that's an attitude? Watch this. I am a professional. I work WWE, bad attitude. All right? So we have a tendency to do these things. We have a tendency to freak out and set a faith up. Lord, what is it you want me to do? How do you want me to handle this? We have a tendency to fall apart, okay, instead of trying to get into his presence. And that's so difficult to do. And especially in the times that we're living in right now, we try to, we try to analyze the situation. We try to control the situation instead of trying to trust him. I want to show you something. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 15. I want to begin to look up, give you some kingdom keys here in a minute. The Bible said, Jesus said that I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth, whatsoever you shall loose on earth. So that means you and I, we have authority in three realms. The spirit realm, the emotional realm, 
and the, and, and the uh, physical realm. All right? Now, John chapter 15, verse 5. Yes, I am the vine. You are the what? Branches. You're the what? Branches. Branches. Those who remain in me. If I say remain. remain. What does that mean? You can't take a break. You can't take time off. You can't skip out. You can't go on vacation. You have to remain. The same thing. It says the same things in Thessalonians when it talks about the rapture, the time of the rapture. It says those that remain, they will be caught up. Not a lot of people are remaining anymore. But it says right here, those who remain where? In me. So you've got to walk the walk, okay? And I in them, and notice this, will produce much fruit. That means you can't just say you're a Christian. There will be evidence in your life to prove your Christianity. Much fruit, okay? Uh, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Isn't that the same thing that Jesus told his disciples? Apart from the Father, I can't do anything on my own. Independently, I just can't do it. I just end up doing what I see the Father do. And Jesus is handing that chain of command that he walked under down to us. You can't do anything on your own. And how many times have we faced a mountain, a giant, a Red Sea situation where we try to take matters into our own hand and we yell at everybody in the family and we take it out on so-and-so, not realizing, you know what, I don't know why I'm looking towards other people because the Bible says that if you put your trust in other people, it's foolish. Amen. We should put our trust in God. All right? So the same principle that Jesus operate, okay, is the same one that he handed down to us. Turn to someone and say, I can't do nothing without him. Okay, now let's ask the question. It says when Jesus saw the multitude coming, he looked up. Okay, you may agree that he looked up and saw the multitude. You may also agree that he looked up and asked the father what he wanted him to do. And the father said, let's give Philip a test. Let's go ahead and feed everybody. Now, why should we look up? That's the question. What's the purpose? Why, should, why bother looking up? The answer is found in the book of Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 is talking about the beginning of the end times and the tribulation period. But it gives us a very big indication of why we should pause to look up to see what Jesus wants us to do. Okay? When you're looking up, number one, you're getting your eyes off the problem. And notice this. So when all these things uh, begin to happen, this is talking about the earthquakes, the plagues, the wars, the rumors of wars, like Ms. Deidre was saying, the hatred and the meanness, all this stuff. It says, when you begin to see these things happen, notice this. Stand and look up. Why? Because it tells you right here, because your salvation is near. How would you and I say that? Well, if I'm facing a situation, I can look at the situation, I can analyze it, I can figure out how I can manipulate it, how I can seduce it, how I can hustle it, how I can walk around it, how I can beat it. I can try to do all that stuff. Or what I can do, instead of giving myself a headache, I can look up. Oh yeah, my help is coming. I'm not in this thing alone. I have a helper. Someone is there to rescue me. His hand is not too short that it cannot save. And so he tells us the reason that we should look up is because of salvation. What is salvation? It's the Greek word sozo, and it means you are about to enter into the God kind of life. What the devil intended for evil God is going to turn those very plans into your good. And so we have to look up. Why? I can't handle this. But I know someone who can. I can't fix this situation. But I know where my help's coming from. I don't have the money for this. But I know who has it all. He counts his money by mountains. Are you getting this? I can't 
change these people's mind concerning this situation. But I know who can. All things are possible. And that's what it's telling us to do when we're facing a crisis or situation. We need to remember to look up for that spiritual guidance. Lord, what is it that you want me to do? I know if I look up, my salvation is near. When you, when you, look, when you look down, most times when people are looking down, it's a sign of discouragement and disappointment. When you look down, you're focusing on destruction and loss. Looking down, you don't see a solution. Your body language shows that you've given up. When you look forward, you're focusing on the circumstances and you're beginning to assume things. And you're trying to figure out, what can I say? What can I do? How can I handle? How can I seduce? How can I manipulate? How can I threaten? How can I handle? And that's looking forward. It's looking at the circumstances. But when you look up, what are you doing? I can't do this. I have to get supernatural guidance. How do you want me to handle this? And the reason I'm looking at you is because you got my days numbered. You knew I was going to be here before I ever got here. You're the way maker. You've already walked this path for me. And we forget that sometimes. Because we get overwhelmed. Our emotions. The details. The intensity of what we're facing. So I want to give you some benefits. <coughs> Excuse me. Some benefits of looking up. Some things that you can begin to incorporate. And what I want to do is I want to take this first verse. And I just want to take it apart. And put it back together. So you can understand how to apply this scripture. Look with me in the book of Matthew chapter 14. Is it okay if I still teach? All right, verse 19. This is something we've learned to do for years. Something from time to time I need to refresh myself because I forget too. Turn to someone and say, I can't believe he does that. <laughs> then he told the people to sit down on the grass. And Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. What did he do? He looked up towards heaven and blessed them. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples and who, distri who distributed it to the people. Within, the, within this one verse, it tells us how to pragmatically, systematically gain control of the situation and turn it over for God by checking his leading. And I want to go ahead and give you those steps. First thing I want to give you is the, a kingdom key. Looking up creates an expectancy for the miraculous. When you're focused at the detail, at the person, at the behavior, at the circumstance, you're creating a vision, but it's not a good one. But when you look up and you get your eyes off the problem, my salvation, my help comes from the Lord. Who do I have in heaven but God? I don't need to try to figure out the details. I just need to reach the divine one. And so you create an expectancy for the miraculous. Picture the scene. Here's a minimum of a thousand people in front of Jesus. He asked Philip, how are we going to feed these guys? Uh, really? Look, Lord, I think you've been working too much. Uh, you know, too much anointing or whatever, but I, I don't know if you know, there's a not enough bread stores, even if we, there's no way. Now, can you imagine all eyes on him? And so he takes, what do we got? Look around. Well, so there's a little boy here, he's got some groceries. Got a couple of loaves of bread, some fishes. That'll do. Um, excuse me, Lord. Maybe we're too high up in elevation in the mountains. And you're not getting this. Two fish, five loaves, multitude. Two fish, five loaves, does not equal multitude. What are we going to do? Well, let's look up. Father, how do you want me to handle this? 
And then the miraculous happened. I want you to notice the pattern. Step one, let me break this verse down systematically. Would that be okay? Yeah. It says, when he told the people to sit down on the grass. What's the first thing he's doing there? He's establishing order. Usually the enemy will try to hit you something and throw chaos into the midst. And so the first thing you have to establish order. With whom? You need to pull yourself together. You're going to want to freak out. You'll want to, you're going to want to do everything. You want to scream, holler, run, get drunk, whatever your, whatever your escape is. And you need to pull yourself together. Okay. This sickness is not unto death. God is bigger. We can handle this. I'm wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost. I'm anointed and appointed. I have weapons of mass destruction. I've got his name. I've got his blood, and I've got the cross. I'm good to go. Let me pull myself together. Yeah, but the doctor said, and he said, and she said, and, and he's leaving, and she doesn't love me no more. And, and, and I'm just going to pull myself together. Now, let me say this. When it involves other people, though, God does not twist people's will to make them do things they don't want to do. If that's the case, you'd be going to church all the time, tithing, serving in the ministry, laying hands on folks, and walking on water. I'll wait for an amen. This, we'll wait for the Baptists to catch up. So you need to pull yourself together. Step number two, it says that Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. Well, what do we get out of that? Well, what we need to do is we need to learn to accept help from others when it's offered. A lot of folks have pride. They don't consider themselves prideful, but we don't want people to know our business. That's pride. A lot of folks have difficulty accepting help. It's pride. Well, you know, I don't want them to think I'm weak. We are all weak. Well, I don't want them to think. People are going to think stuff about you no matter what. The day you were born, you may have come out looking like a frog. And they thought, put it back, it's not done. People are going to think what they want to think. Who cares what they think? It doesn't matter what they think. This is something that I had to learn to do. You know, in, in this town, because we're not a denomination, a mainline denomination, because we're a, a Bible teaching church, we're a word of faith church, you and I, we're, according to the, this town, the atmosphere in this town, we're the cult. We're the crazy. We had Kenneth Copeland here, that prosperity preacher. We've had Jerry Savelle here, that other preacher. According to this town, we are the loons. Are you getting this? The eagle that is on the sign outside. Before we were able to mount it, we had it sitting on stage because we had no place to store it. We had some folks coming in wanted to rent the church to do a wedding. They were Baptists. They walked in. They saw the eagle said, is this what you worship? And I thought to myself, you can't be kidding me. <laughs> you can't get more tarted than that. They thought we were bound down to an eagle. Can you imagine the ignorance? Now, the bad part about this, these people are teaching your kids in school. And I couldn't believe it. You've got to be kidding me. We've got this reputation. Well, you're that prosperity church. I'd rather be wealthy than broke. You want to be broke? Go across the street. And so you have to just get past people of what they think about you. Well, I don't want them. It doesn't matter. What matters is what does God think? So I started, you know, the lesson that the Lord showed me, he said, if they don't believe you, believe the works that I do through you. Look around, building, bought, paid for. We're reaching thousands through the Bible college. International ministry on the, on the web. We've got a lot of folks watching, you know, uh, from Belton. This is like Nazareth. No good thing comes out of Nazareth. This is Belton. Walmart used to close their, their, their doors at 6 and the farmers went to bed with the chickens at 7. What could come out of, what could come out of Belton? And look what God's doing. So you have to quit worrying about what other people think. 
It doesn't matter. People don't think what they want to think. That's why I, you know, I picked up the moniker from Brother Copeland. You have no idea how much I don't care what you think. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. Look what God is doing. And that's the way I handle it now. Are you getting any of this? A lot of you would be liberated if you would just not surrender your brain to other, other folks. Other folks. This is not cows. <laughs> Man. Forget the others. This was just the kid's groceries. Jesus didn't go, well, we can't take this boy's groceries. His mama may be poor. You know, I don't want people to think, you know, he's Jesus. Look what he did. He takes his kids groceries. Why didn't he just call manna from heaven if he's the son of God? He accepted the help when it was offered. Hey, there's a kid here. He's got some loaves and fishes. Great, I'll take it. And most of you, by the silence in this sanctuary, can't handle that. Receiving help from others reveals how much pride is really there. Step three. Amen, Pastor John. No, settle down. Settle down. Step three. It says he looked towards heaven. Okay? What, what do you do? You look towards heaven. You wait for orders from headquarters. God will tell you what to do. Okay? What are you doing? I'm going to entrust God, okay, to show me what to do. And then you act on it. If you don't get anything, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, then do something. Because God correct, can correct your something that you're doing and make it the right thing. He's still God. I, I know about preachers. They'll stand at home in their closet, in their, in their boxers. Lord, show me what to wear. I'm thinking, just put on something. Hide that big old chicken gut. Because your land overflows with fat. You are a fat offering unto the Lord. Just trust God. If it's the wrong move, you'll know. But start out by doing something. And trust God to show you what to do. Step number three, it says that Jesus blessed them. Now, let me ask you another question. The understood subject matter is fishes and loaves. According to English diction, that would be correct. But is it possible that he also blessed the people? Lord, I thank you that when they receive this, that this portion will fill them and that there'll be fragments left over. He was prophesying an overflow. Is it possible when it says he blessed them, not just the food, but those that were involved? What does that mean? That means you need to speak the promise, not the problem. Is anybody getting this? Okay. Our words either accelerate or hinder our goals. I know right now we're facing a challenge and, and I have to just, I have to catch myself, and correct myself. No, we can do this. God is bigger. We can handle this. It's all right. We've been here before. All things are possible. Now everything inside screams the opposite. What we're seeing and feeling and going through screams the opposite. Are you getting this? But you have to stop and take a breath. No, no, God is bigger than this. I'm going to make God bigger than the problem. Yes. And that's what we have to do. And so now it says, and he blessed them. Speak, speak the promise, not the problem. Father, I thank you that all things are going to turn out for my good. Are you getting this? You know, the thing that we've been confessing over the church body, over a pandemic. You know, people are testing and so forth. We started out. Psalms 91 verse 10, no plague shall come to our dwelling. So the plague came, but there's been no death. Now, that doesn't make sense, but I thought we rebuked it. We did. The death angel didn't show up. Are you getting this? Now, so the enemy wants to use that technicality to mess with us. But it's not going to happen. In all things, we are more than conquerors in everything that we do. 
This is not a sickness unto death. Amen. Our finances shall not be hindered. They shall grow. Amen. The anointing shall increase day by day. Amen. The favor that I walk in on a daily basis is increasing everywhere I go. Amen. Though a thousand may fall on one side and ten thousand on another, I shall fear no evil. Yeah. Are you getting this? It's perspective. You speak the promise, not the problem. And some folks just fall apart. So speak a blessing. Step number five, it says this in, in this verse. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces. What does that mean? You do what you can. You know what most folks would do? They would stop, they would look at the bread, they'd look at the people. They'd look at the bread, look at the people. Look at the fish, look at the people. Even if I made tuna, it's enough to enough feed the people. Bread, people. Fish, people. And we think, okay, if I pinched off a little bit to everybody, maybe everybody will get a piece. And so we become analytical again. But it says that he, that breaking the loaves, what did he do? He did what he could. And he allowed God to do what he couldn't. He didn't go, well, I hope this works. Let's see how long this lasts. Okay, the first five people front row got it. Sorry guys, should have been here sooner. Don't forget to sign up for the ministry. Are you getting this? He did what he could. And what we need to do is we need to stop trying to figure out how God is going to do things. We have these, we set ourselves up for disappointment and discouragement because we come up with these preconceived ideas. Well, so-and-so is a mechanic. Maybe if I throw him some hints, God will move upon him and he'll volunteer services and save me a couple of bucks. Well, I know she works on computers and if I throw some hints, I won't have to take it to the geek squad and I'll save me a couple of bucks. We start trying to stop, we need to stop trying to figure out God. And, and don't look at the details for people's responses. <coughs> We're always looking into behavior. Is this helping anybody? We're always looking into people's behaviors and responses to see if we have God or not. Let me give you an illustration. It's a total contradiction. This commander named Naaman had leprosy of the Armenian army. He was not, he was not a Jew. He was an oppressor to the Jew. He was a soldier. He was a high-ranking officer. He's used to getting his way. His little slave girl a little hand captured a Hebrew uh, girl from a war told him if you'll go see the prophet Elisha you'll be get healed and so he had this preconceived idea I'm gonna march up on my horse Elisha's gonna come out and he's gonna say yes I say unto thee that the great Jehovah God 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 will heal thee 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 Thunder, lightning, clouds, UFOs, and angels. And so he pulled up to Elisha's house. And Gehazi shows up. Um, he's not coming out right now. But he said if you'll go dip in the Jordan River. What do you mean he's not coming out? I rode all this way. Does he know who I am? And the Bible says that Naaman was wroth, mad as a hornet. You can imagine him as a soldier, cussing, upset, throwing things around, thinking to himself, you know what? I should just burn down his house. I should just kill his servant. Because he's Naaman. He's a, an enemy commander. And the Bible says he was wroth. He was so mad he couldn't see straight. And he rode home. Mad as a hornet. 
I'm sure he took it out on this little Hebrew girl. What were you thinking? What was I thinking? Why did you, you embarrass me in front of my soldiers? He was mad. And so the little girl real sweetly talks him into it. Well, if he asked you to do something great, wouldn't you do it? Yeah, but our own river is better than the Jordan River. He's mad. Does everybody see he's mad? He's mad. He doesn't have a faith attitude. He's not walking by faith. He doesn't feel the anointing of favor, grace, and mercy upon his life. He's mad as a hornet, and he can't stand the Jews now because he just got embarrassed by this little Jewish girl and Elisha. But somehow or another, she talked him into going and dipping in the river. He's mad. This is stupid. Our river's better than theirs. I don't see what the problem is. I bet I look like an idiot in front of my soldiers. Hey, wait a minute. Was he full of faith? No. Was he expecting God's grace? No. Was he walking in mercy minded? No. He was mad. The Bible says very clearly he was wroth. That means a burning anger inside of him that if somebody would have said the wrong thing, he would have run his sword through and went home happy. You ever get that man? Come here, kitty. I'm just going to kick you. Oh, I feel better. I hope that doesn't go viral. <laughs> and even though he was angry and he had no covenant with God and he was an oppressor of the Jewish people, God healed him anyways. And he was healed of lepers. Now it doesn't make sense. Because everything that we teach in the faith movement, the charismatic movement, you've got to have this, you've got to have that. But sometimes God's love overrides everything. And his love is trying to hunt you down and bless you and promote you and keep you healed and prosperous. Does everybody see this? We have the agape, the unconditional love of God on our side. And you know the good thing, excuse me for a moment, the good thing is that love never fails. Never fails. All we have to do is continue to walk in love. Now, so we need to learn to accept help, do what we can. Naaman finally did what he could. All right, I'm going to dip in the river. Any of you guys, any of my soldiers say anything, I swear I'm going to demote you and you'll be peeling potatoes. Hello? So we need to stop trying to figure God out. Don't look at the details. He's going to do what needs to be done. He can do what we can. All we have to do is just be simply obedient. Step number six, it said in that verse, that Jesus gave the bread to the disciples. What does that mean? That means you need to allow others to be used by God on your behalf. God will send you people. You may not like their attitude. You may not like the way they're dressed. You may not like their smell. You not, may not like the way they believe. But God will send you people. How does God bless you? Luke 6.38. He causes other men to give unto your bosom. It comes through people. But they don't always come in a package that you think. Are you getting any of this? Okay. So you need to allow others to be used by God on your behalf. What does that mean? Don't try to control them. Don't try to micromanage them. Don't look at their behaviors. Okay? Just trust God that God is going to move through them their way. Amen. One of my favorite examples is, is uh, making spaghetti. Some of you, when you make spaghetti, you boil the water first, put in the spaghetti. How many of you do that? Bunch of heathens. <laughs> Some of you, when you put in the water, you also put in the spaghetti. How many of you do that? Do you know if you add oil, the spaghetti doesn't stick together. If you add salt, that the salt causes the water to boil quicker, you won't have any problem. That's the Italian way. Both are right. 
I, I, I had, uh, uh, I knew somebody when, when he ate cereal, he put the milk in first, then the cereal. See? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. But he had cereal. It's the old argument of the toilet paper. How does it hang? Underneath or above? Okay, if you look at the patent, it was originally patented for it to hang above, but some folks like it underneath. I hate going to those public bathrooms where, you know, you want to blow your nose, you've got to reach up in there and it hurts your wrist and it's poking you and then you want to kick the thing off the wall. <laughs> that has absolutely nothing to do with this message. So let's just move right along. Stop trying to micromanage. That's what I was talking about. Okay. Step number seven, it says that Jesus, who distributed it to the people, the disciples distributed it to the people. What does that mean? You, sometimes you just got to let go and let God. Sometimes your help will come from the most unlikely people. Your blessing will come from the most unlikely people. Are you getting any of this? So we need to trust God that God will flow through others. We need to get uh, that, that God is going to get the right person to, to, to you to do the right thing. Amen. Simple as that. But it all starts by doing this. How do you want me to handle this? Think about this. Jesus could have picked on any one of his disciples. Hey, John. <laughs> we got a multitude. How are we going to beat him? Now, if we know John's characteristic, he would have just leaned on Jesus and go, I don't know, but you know, Lord. Peter was a hothead. He carried a sword. He carried a concealed weapon. It's true. When Jesus was being arrested, where do you think that came from? His loincloth? He carried a concealed weapon. Cut off Malchus's ear. Peter was a hothead. I don't know, but if you give me the word, I'll take them on and send them home. No, we're not going to do that either. Uh, what about Thomas? Well, I don't know if we can feed all these people, you know. Man, I'll tell you what. Judas, I don't think we have enough money... Philip, Mr. Analytical. Let's feed these people. <laughs> you never know what God is going to do. But if we would just learn from Jesus. When you're facing a situation and you're not sure. Or you get that report from the doctor or, or whatever. And you're struggling on the inside. Instead of looking down for defeat, instead of focusing on the circumstances, try looking up. Lord, this, this is overwhelming. I can see this mountain in my peripheral, but I can see that you're bigger than my mountain. I can see this giant, but I can see that you're bigger than my giant. I know my help is coming from you. I'm just going to stop. I'm not going to make a decision out of my emotions. And I'm going to see what you want me to do about it. Let, let me begin to wrap this up. Did anybody learn anything? All right. I said I'm beginning to wrap it up. Don't order any pizza yet. All right. Some of y'all got it already on your phone. Mark chapter 7 verse 34. I want to show you what else. The benefit of looking up. Give you some more kingdom keys. We've got 27 more to go. Seriously, I'm kidding. Now notice this. Then Jesus looked up in prayer and he groaned how? Now, what does groaning symbolize? He's frustrated. Jesus looked up in prayer and he groaned mightily and commanded Ephatha, okay, open up. He's frustrated that this uh, demonic entity this deaf and dumb spirit had plugged the ears of this individual. And he knew that they were children of Abraham. They had covenant rights, just like you and I, but not everybody's walking in their covenant rights. And so he's frustrated. Looking up keeps your emotions in check. You ever just want to just... He just... Okay... How do you want me to handle this? Because I don't, 
I'm getting tired of this devil stuff. I'm getting tired of his attacks on your people. You know, the blind, the lame, the halt, the maim. This guy can't hear. Isn't it amazing he spoke to a deaf man and the deaf man heard what he said and his ears opened? Epica. Open up. That's what you, some of you should be screaming on uh, uh, Black Friday after uh, Thanksgiving. Epitha! I want my TV. Looking up keeps your emotions in check. Jesus uh, is diffusing his emotions, his frustration, by looking up and just praying. How many times have we faced a situation and, and your sailor language wants to come out? How many of you remember having sailor language? Because if you don't raise your hand, you a lie. Because <laughs> sometimes when we stub our toe, hallelujah does not come out. Well, I, I can't. I'm toe stubbing free. I've been delivered from that. His humanity wanted to come to the surface. He groaned. Mightily. Rah! And he looked up. Okay. How many times have you looked at people and I'm just just going to send them home to Jesus now. <laughs> Why prolong their misery? Lord, if you'll just use me, I'll lay hands on them. Acts chapter 7, verse 65. Let's look at another benefit. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost. This is Stephen. Stephen's about to be killed. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked at everybody with the rocks. No. He looked up steadfastly. The crowd is yelling at him. They're beginning to pelt him with rocks. They're kill, calling his name. You're going to end up dead, dude. We're tired of your mess. You've been doing this Jesus thing, delivering groceries, laying hands on the widows and orphans. And miracles are happening. We don't want another Jesus incident. So they begin to pelt him with stones. He's about to die. So he said steadfastly. You know what that means? He had to keep focused. He could see a rock flying at his head and dodge. Move out of the way. Ooh. Steadfastly. The devil tried to distract him. But he went steadfastly into heaven. Okay? And he saw the what? The glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. The kingdom key that I want you to get out of this is looking up can reveal God's glory. Sometimes we go through some dark seasons and we've been walking through the valley of the shadow of death for so long that the only thing we know is shadow and death. And we forget. Now what this also tells us that when a believer is about to pass away, they see their final destination. There are many hospital incidences and people dying on deathbeds saying and reaching out because they see the final destination. But they didn't look down at their toes. They didn't look at the bedpan. They didn't stare at the nurse. They're all looking up. When you look up, you'll begin to see the glory of God and he can reveal the destination. Am I talking to anybody? All right, so turn to someone and say, you need to look up. Now, let's go to 2 Kings, chapter 6. Here's my second closure. Then Elisha prayed, New Living Translation, O Lord, open the eyes and let him see. This is a, 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 a Elisha, okay, praying for a servant. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And uh, when he did what? Looked up. Looked up. Where was he looking? Elisha and his servant are surrounded by armies. Let's see, there's me, this old man, and me. This old man and me. This old man and me. One, two, three, four. Oh, spears. <laughs> oh, swords. <laughs> oh, horses and chariots. <laughs> uh, 
there's Elijah, there's me. <laughs> and there's Elijah, and there's me. <laughs> and Elijah's going, hey, listen, we serve a bigger God. We may be outnumbered. We may not have the money. We may not have the status. We may not have the ability. But this shows you that you can also pray on behalf of others. Lord, let them see your hand moving in their life. His eyes were open. After he did what? Looked up. He didn't see the army in front of him. He looked above the army and he saw the angelic host. Are you getting this? See, the enemy wants you to focus at the giant. Man, look how big that giant is. I'm just focusing on one spot, that space right between his eyes. He's going to have a splitting headache by the time I'm through. Etc. and ain't got nothing on him. Are you getting this? Looking up lets you see, okay, the reality of your situation. This servant thought he and Elisha were toast. Oh, well, Jewish, matzo balls. They thought that, that's it. We're done. But when he looked up, he saw the heavenly host. And he realized, we're not in this thing alone. This is a totally different situation than what I thought. And how many times have we thrown up our hands in frustration, ready to give in, give up, kill somebody, hide the body in the trunk? Are you getting this? We need to remember to look up. Turn to your mind and say, look up. A heavenly perspective always encourages uh, uh, and edifies the ones who are willing to look up. Just look up. In the book of John, chapter 16, verse 13. When the spirit of truth comes, okay, he, the Holy Ghost, will guide you into truth. Why? The King James Version says that the truth will make you what? Free. So he guides you into truth. And truth equals freedom, okay? He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. Jesus said that. But he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the what? Future. How many of you have the Holy Ghost? Let me tell you this. Even if you don't speak in tongues, the day you got born again, you received the Holy Ghost. Amen. Tongues is just evidence. Now, so within each and every one of us, we have a supernatural God. Okay? That's the Holy Spirit. Let me close this up. John chapter 16, verse 14. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he, what? Receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. And this is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Jesus got it from the Father. Jesus said, I'm leaving physically, but I'm going to leave you my presence. And we've got the Holy Ghost. And the way that Jesus got it from the Father is the way the Holy Spirit gets it from Jesus. And we have the same thing. We are a supernatural people. But we get so caught up in our trials and tribulations that we forget to look up. Now, he will, it says the Holy Spirit will direct you supernaturally. How do I know that the Holy Ghost, how do I know he, what he's trying to get me to do? I don't get it. Now, most sermons would stop here. The Holy Ghost will show you. Amen. Well, how does the Holy Ghost show you? The book of Romans, chapter 9, verse 1. I teach this a lot because I really want believers to get it, especially in these last days. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter, see I didn't say utter, <laughs> utter truth. That was a test, wasn't it? Utter, tr <laughs> utter truth, a little mess. My conscience. 
And the Holy Spirit confirms it. How do I know that this is what God wants me to do? Well, the Holy Spirit is going to bear witness or show you what Jesus would do. And you're going to know it in your conscience. The world calls it having a hunch. I have a feeling. We say it like this. I just know that I know. Is it logical? No. Does it make sense? No. Is it reasonable? No. What is it? Supernatural. But my conscience, the Holy Ghost will speak to your conscience. You will know that you know. And that's why I wanted to encourage you that even if you step out and I'm going to go this way, you're going to have a hunch, a feeling. No, maybe I should go this way. And the Bible tells us this. Follow after things which make for peace. And that's how you tell you've got the right decision. I'm going to take a left. Eh, it just doesn't feel right. Okay, I'm going to go right. Yeah, that, that, seems, that seems okay. That's called peace. So you know you've got the kingdom directed. The kingdom of God is love, joy, peace in the Holy Ghost. So I want to encourage you in the times that we're living in. It can be very frustrating right now. It can be very challenging. It can be very scary. Financial situations, medical situations, family situations, social unrest, signs of the apocalypse. Now more than ever before, we need to remind ourselves, oh yeah, I'm not in this thing alone. I'm not without a solution. All I have to do is look up. Lord, what is it you want me to do? How do you want me to handle this belligerent person? How do you want me to handle this financial situation? How do you want me to handle my problems? What is it that you would have me do? Get some orders from headquarters. And if it doesn't come right away, then what do I do, Pastor John? Do something. Make a decision. And if it's the wrong one, okay, then God will redirect it. When you make a decision based on the scriptures, what is written, okay, that's the spirit of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to apply scripture. And let me tell you what God does. Sometimes... You get to a point in your Christian walk where God doesn't answer you right away. Anybody ever experienced that? He doesn't answer you right away. When you first got saved, God went! It was a nook nook in your mouth. Diapers changed, bottle burped, put down the bed, you're good to go. But as you got older, hey, hello, God, God, where, where are you, you, you? And what's happening is God is trying to get you off of milk and having to run to change your diaper and becoming responsible for yourself. He expects us to grow up. So when he doesn't answer right away, what's, being, what's happening in your life is God knows that you know the word and he's expecting you to act upon the word. What happens? We stop there comes a place in your Christian walk with God when you stop being a servant and you start becoming a son. It's called sonship. The book of Galatians talks about it. When you were first introduced into the household of God, you had to be tutored. You had to be trained. You had to learn the protocol of the kingdom. It's no different than if you're royalty. When you're royalty, you may be born a prince, but you still have to learn how to be a king. you got to learn the protocol. But once you learn the protocol and you know what the protocol is, then you enter into sonship. You become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And he puts you in charge because he knows, I don't have to run to you every five minutes. I've got other babies to take care of. You've grown up. You know what my word says, and I expect you to act on it. And if you're not sure, where does my help come from? 
comes from above. And you're going to know that you know. Did you learn something this morning? Yeah. Give the Lord a hand clap if you will. I'd like to do this. If you are facing a challenge or facing something right now, I'd like for you to just stand where you're at. And you may not mean whether it's a financial challenge, a medical challenge, a family challenge, something personal. I'd like for you to just, those of you that are seated around them, if you'll just stretch your hands for them. Now, I just want you to do something. This is a, this is a, it's called a prophetic act. I want you to act on something. I want you to just close your eyes and I want you to just tilt your head back like you're looking up. But keep your eyes closed. Now let's say this together. Heavenly Father, my help is coming from you. I'm going to focus on you from this moment forward. I'm not going to look around. I'm not going to look down. But I'm going to continue to look up. And I'm going to make your promise bigger than this problem. So I receive your supernatural guidance and leading at this very moment in Jesus' name. Now I want you to take a deep breath and don't get in a hurry. We're always in a hurry to do nothing. Always in a hurry. Just take a deep breath. You may hear a scripture. You may hear a sentence. You may have a hunch, a feeling, but don't be in a rush. I was up all night wrestling with the enemy. All night long. Pastor Karen was too. Worn out. Just all night long. Being bombarded by lies from the enemy. And then one scripture broke through and allowed me to make a punch against the forces of darkness. But it took all night. I don't know about you, I don't run from a fight. The devil's best has never been good enough. And I know you're the same way too. We are not a bunch of losers. Are you getting this? Learn to relax. Trust God. Enjoy the journey. I believe with all of my heart, based on the scripture, that you've received an answer today. It may not be logical, you may not like it, you may not agree with it, but if it's God's word, then it's going to work out for your betterment. But we have to trust Him. Can you receive that today? Amen. Give the Lord another hand. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.